Stormborn by Black K. Cat. Chapter 9. First Movement. Requiem for Bells. Requiem. A dirge, hymn, or musical service for the repose of the dead. He dreams, as ever, of the past and present intertwined, of Kanaha when there were only three faces on the mountain, one newly carved in honor of the third to wear the Hokage's hat. He dreams of walking through streets untouched by damage from Kurama or Orochimaru's failed invasion with his usual escort long since abandoned and the fire country sun hot on his face. Orochi! A man calls and Naruto turns with a grin lighting up his features at the sound of it. Saru! He calls back even as the sign Dame Hokage missing all signs of his office beyond a Kanaha Hitayate jogs a few steps to fall in beside him. Hiruza makes a face at him, heedless of his dignity. But then, he's only been Hokage for a handful of weeks, not long enough to grow stiff yet. I really wish you wouldn't call me that, he complains. Naruto laughs and stretches his arms above his head as they enter the training grounds, twisting to pop his spine into alignment. Ah, but if I don't, who will? He asks cheerfully. If you're not careful, you might turn into one of those stuffy old men squirreled away in the office all the time. As your friend, it's my duty to save you from such a fate. Oh, kind of you, Iruzen drawls, not quite managing to hide the roll of his eyes. But he doesn't complain when Naruto takes a seat beneath an old spreading oak tree, just joins him, leaning back against the rough bark with a sigh. The day is lazy and muggy, a thunderstorm threatening at the edges of the sky, but still a ways off. And for once, there are no pressing duties to attend to, nothing to demand their attention for a few hours at least. Are you staying long this time? Hiruzen asks at length. Just so I know how much of an allowance for damages to write into the yearly budget, of course. Mm. Naruto snorts, shaking his head. The two silver bells he's wearing, threaded onto red ribbons and securing his long hair in a loose tail, chime softly with emotion. He's never managed to break the habit of wearing such things. Not since Mito's gift of her belled hair ornaments. Those are reserved for special occasions, or moments when he's feeling especially sentimental. But he has others to wear now as well. Yui's in charge back home, and Shunka is helping her, he says with amusement, thinking of how his petite, weefish, and entirely hot-headed assistant and laid-back, lazy, forever-amused Jonas Sokomando are likely butting heads at this very moment. They've never gotten along. Naruto likes to call it unresolved sexual tension, but that always makes Yui call him a pig and Shunka smile threateningly and finger her kunai. Ginrei, the chief medic, agrees with Naruto. But then Ginrei has always been a fan of anything that ruffles Shinka's feathers. Honestly, if I'm gone for more than a week, I think one of them will hunt me down and drag me back hog-tied and screaming. Hiruzen laughs. Because he met both Kunoichi the last time Naruto was in Kana. Several months before Toby Rama's death, and therefore understands that there's a 50-50 chance that Uzushia will have gone up in flames by the time Naruto gets back. Perhaps literally even. Unusually for an Uzumaki, Yui has a fire affinity. I wish you the best of luck, but would not take your place for all the glory in the world, he informs his friend, shaking his head. He stretches his legs out in front of him, crossing them at the angle, and then sighs. Saindame Hokage. God, what was Sensei thinking? Naruto studies him for a moment, seeing the faint lines of well-hidden grief, and has to conceal a wince. Kanaha has only recently come from a war, and everyone is mourning someone. Hiruzen more than most, with the loss of his mentor, as well as his comrades. He has reached the highest position a shinobi can, but the glory is bittersweet. Uzu Shio is lucky. So far, both of its previous kages retired peacefully. Kanaha, on the other hand, is getting a bad track record. But the sun is bright, and the trees are green, and children are laughing somewhere in the distance. Kanaha is still standing regardless of its losses, and the day is too nice to linger on grim thoughts. Decided, Naruto darts a hand forward in a blur of motion and yanks on Iruzen's goatee, not too gently. Sarutobi Iruzen, Saitame Hokage of the oldest shinobi village and one of the most powerful ninja in the elemental countries, squawks, flails, and almost tumbles over backwards in an attempt to get away. Never one to waste an advantage, Naruto takes the opportunity to get safely out of range. Only then does he allow himself to shake with laughter at the sight of his friend. You mean Toby Rama? He was thinking that with the old man beard, you already looked the part, of course. 
he taunts me to fits of giggles at the other man's expression. You brat! He roos and hisses even as he rises to his feet with a growl and throws himself forward. Now we're trying to but he's laughing too hard to make a good show of it, and the Hokage catches him around the waist with a lunge and bears them both to the ground. They wrestle for a moment, attempting to grind each other's faces into the grass before Hiruza takes advantage of proximity and snags the bells from Naruto's hair. Naruto splutters as the locks come tumbling down into his eyes and mouth, and Hiruza grows his triumph as the Uzukake falter squirming out of the bond's grasp like an eel and retreating a few feet to brandish his prize. These are my nerves! Now, he tells Naruto smugly, tucking them away in his kunai pouch with an entirely unnecessary flourish. <laughs> Consider it a fit payment for your assault on the Hokage's person. Naruto sticks his tongue out at him even as he climbs to his feet. With a huff, he winds his fingers in his hair and drags it out of his face, grimacing at the leaves and twigs now littering it. Jerk, he mutters half-heartedly. What are you going to do with bells? Pretty as you are, Hiruzen, I don't think they're quite your color. Lies, Hiruzen buries cheerfully, though he gives in and passes Naruto a pair of Senmon to use instead. Red is most certainly my color, and I'm not sure yet. Maybe I'll make a teamwork exercise out of them and use it on my Ganin team when I get one. Bells, Naruto repeats skeptically, twisting his hair into a sloppy bun and sliding the slender needles through to secure it. What kind of teamwork exercise can you do with bells? Never underestimate the sadistic imagination of a jonin sensei. Hiruzen grins at him, then turns in the direction of the village. Come on, he calls over his shoulder. A new ramen stand just opened near the administration building, and I've been wanting to try it. You treat, right? Rolling his eyes, Naruto follows. My treat? Hiruzen, if you think that you can get out of paying every time just because I missed your appointment ceremony, it was a very important day for me, Hiruzen says solemnly, though his dark eyes are dancing. Life-altering, and it truly broke my heart to see that one of my best friends didn't even bother to put in an appearance. Shattered it into pieces, really. So take responsibility for your actions, Arashi. Does Kanaha know they have a great big moocher as Hokage? Naruto retorts, but he doesn't resist as Hiruzen steers them toward the ramen stand. I feel like I'm socially obligated to warn someone about this. It could spell absolute disaster for your economy, and then Uzushio would be left to pick up the pieces after Kanaha's destruction by its enormous moocher of a leader. This coming from the man who leaves mortal enemies in charge of his village while he's away. And not just mortal enemies, but a ridiculously strong Kethar user with a hair trigger temper and an assassin so skilled at silent killing that she gives Kiri Hunter in nightmares. I wouldn't go so far as to call them mortal enemies. Oh really? Then what would you call them? Uh, rivals? Rivals generally doesn't include wanting to rip each other's throats out behanded, and I know Yuri-san threatened to do that last time you left her alone with Ookami-san. Oh, shut up, Saru! Jiraiya goes to his old teacher the first time he's assigned a Ganin team of his own and asks if Sarutobi would be alright with him using the bell test his own team had been given that first day. Sarutobi just looks at him for a long moment, seated behind his desk with his pipe in one hand, and then he very, very carefully reaches into his robes and withdraws a pair of silver bells strung on crimson ribbons. He weighs them in his hand for a moment and then asks, Do you remember meeting Uzumaki Arashi Jiraiya? Jiraiya blinks at the unexpected question, rocking back on his heels and chewing at the corner of his lip. I... do. He affirms after a moment, because it's hard to forget a man like Arashi, forever smiling and laughing and still unspeakably deadly, a friendly summer sea just barely concealing the furious tempest beyond the horizon. Jiraiya has seen the aftermath of the attack on Usushio, and despite the ruined city, what had caught his attention first was the graveyard of Kiri ships off the coast, torn apart by wind and water wielded by a man who more than lived up to his title. He also remembers meeting their teacher at the training grounds one bright and sunny morning, long after they all became jonin and a handful of weeks after Mito's death left Uzumaki Kushina, the Cubijin Cherokee. 
only to find absolute destruction, rubble and craters and fire, and Saratobi in the midst of it all, expression flat and eyes burning. Tsunade had asked what was wrong, but he'd said nothing, and it was only later that they found out Uzushio had been leveled almost two weeks past before they could even call for help. Sarutobi sighed, then drawing Jiraiya's gaze again and reaches out. Carefully, with a faint sense of ceremony, he takes Jiraiya's wrist, tips the bells into his broad palm, and gently closes his fingers over them. Those were his, he says softly, withdrawing three paces to stand by the window, his face backlit by the sunlight and entirely unreadable. He let me have them after I stole them in a spar, and I used them for the bell test in honor of his loyalty to his friends and his dedication to the people of his village. You are welcome to them, Jiraiya, but if you pass them on, would you remember? Throat sick. Jiraiya simply nods, carefully transferring the bells to his own pouch and then bowing to his teacher. I won't forget, he promises. And he doesn't. Minato hears the story when he gets his Ganin team. Kagashi hears it too, though it means less to him by then. Uzushio faded to a collective memory that's rarely discussed. But he hears it, remembers, and Zarutobi watches it all and thinks of laughter in the sunlight and the bright, sweet chime of bells. They've timed their arrival in Kanaha just right. There's no moon, and clouds cover vast swaths of stars, leaving the village dark and eerie, the shadows drowning deep and all but unbroken. Naruto moves quick and silent through them, not needing to look to know that Haku is flanking him. Here and there, scattered across the village in ones and twos and small tight clusters are chakra signatures. Not of people, but of seals. Tiny bits of darkness. Shards no one but a Fuinjutu master familiar with the organization would think to track, but Naruto can feel them all like pins against his skin. Each and every one of them. He comes to a halt at the edge of the boundary fence, tall and imposing and far more dangerous than it appears at first glance, and feels more than sees. Haku slide up into the branches of the oak at the corner. A pause, and Naruto counts his heartbeats to control his impatience. He's gotten better at these kinds of missions, remembers enough about being a Rashi and from his own Gani days to contain himself, but it's still not him not natural or desired in any sort of way but there are only a few seconds before frost forms on the ground in front of him shaping itself into four parallel lines four guards then all root on boo but that's to be expected naruto gives the signal to go and bounds over the fence in a flash that's almost too quick to be seen then drops into the beautifully arrayed garden on the other side and crouches in the bushes there sense straining for any movement but there's none, only a faint, whispering breeze he can tell is natural, and he lets out a slow, silent breath in relief. One obstacle down. Only about a hundred more to go. Oh, Danzo is such a paranoid warmonger. Though, granted, considering the number of people who would happily slit his throat, and not just among Kanaha's enemies, perhaps it's justified. Another 30 seconds of silence just to make sure they have a bed spotted. And then Haku joins him in a flicker of speed and shadows. His visor is gone, as is Naruto's mask. Both are distinctive, easily identifiable, and if they're caught here and doing this, they're going to have a lot more to worry about than just having their faces bare. A guard passes, going left, and a moment later, one in the opposite direction. Naruto feels their seals disappear into the distance and then raises a hand, fingers twisting as he signs... Take a clockwise run, it seals every 10 meters, 3 minute window to meet up. Haku nods in understanding, already pulling a stack of paper squares from his weapons pouch as he slips away. Naruto doesn't let himself watch his friend go. He's a kage. Haku is a skilled jonin and regularly plays his bodyguard, and they're both more than capable of looking out for each themselves. Instead, he pulls out his own ceiling papers and lays one against the wall, right where it joins the ground and settles into place with barely a flicker of chakra. As long as he waits for the guards to pass him before he sets them, they should go unnoticed. The seals are glorified recording devices, honestly, though it took Naruto weeks to tweak them enough to work for something like this. This is Dunzo's stronghold, his lair, but when he and Haku are done ringing it with seals designed to record and remember chakra signatures, present wards, and guard rotations, they'll have a way in. Of course, there's a chance that Danzo hides all his information and records somewhere else, but Naruto doesn't think that's likely. After all, the man is suspicious and upset, and he probably won't want to risk anyone else running across his files should they stumble on some other hideout. Here in his house, he likely feels safe. Naruto won't let him hold on to that safety for long. Not after what he did. 
Not after what he'll do in the future if he's not stopped. Now! He slaps his last seal into place just as Haku slides empty-handed through the bushes, entirely unharmed. The brunette nods to signal that everything's well, then leaps the wall in a blur. There's no outcry, no sudden alarm. So Naruto follows him, touching down lightly in the streets. He's angry, and it's not a familiar sensation. Not anymore, at least. Because regardless of the destruction that Uzushio faced, it's better now. Repaired and rebuilt, and as strong as ever, but... But that likely won't last long if Danzo has his way. Uzumaki Reishi was a good, kind child, Naruto knows. Forever soft-spoken and easygoing, in direct contrast to his hot-headed aunt. That last glimpse of him, horrified, haunted, angry, has troubled Naruto since he first saw it. The boy was a chunin, but an elite one, and particularly clever. He'd gone to Kanaha some months before the invasion, studying the katon techniques that few in Whirlpool country could teach him, and when he had come back, it seemed nothing had changed. But clearly, something had. And combining knowledge of that with Orochimaru and Kabuto's tales of Root and Danzo's machinations during the Third Shinobi War, the picture becomes unhappily clear. Naruto has no body to check for a seal. No way to tell if he's correct in his suspicions, but he'll raid Danzo's files to find out and not feel an ounce of shame in doing so. For Reishi. For Yui. For all of Uzushio and what Danzo likely wrought. He'll do it. For them, he won't let anyone or anything stop him. Sakura finds Sasuke in the bar just after midnight, the way she always seems to when his late night drinking stretches to lengths she considers excessive. It's rarely the same bar, and never the same one twice in a row, since Sasuke has no attachment to the places beyond a desire for darkness, solitude, and lots of high-proof alcohol, which in a shinobi bar tends to be the standard. But regardless, as soon as 12 o'clock passes, if he isn't headed back to his apartment, she inevitably slides onto the stool beside him a few minutes later. If he were a more suspicious person, he might think it was a conspiracy. Long day. She asks him now, signaling for the bartender to bring her one of whatever Sasuke's having. Sasuke tosses back the last of his and thinks vaguely that she's going to regret it to not a trained tolerance or not. He'll drink for the taste, certainly, but not at times like this. Not when all day has been filled into bursting with thoughts of their lost teammate. He knows better than to try and drink away his memories. Knows from experience that alcohol never drowns out blue eyes or an achingly familiar voice, but it helps. It blunts the sharp, cutting edges of his thoughts and gives him enough peace to sleep. Even times like now, when he's learned that Naruto still has family out there. And what if he went to them? What if he left Konoha because there was nothing here for him? Because Sasuke wasn't enough. And went to live with this other Uzumaki who's a Kage and rebuilt his village and a relative, which is something Sasuke will never be. Hey! A fist impacts the top of his head, gently, for Sakura, which likely means she's actually worried about him. Sasuke doesn't quite yelp, but it's a near thing. He pulls back, wrenches around, and glares at the Konoichi, who raises an unimpressed eyebrow in return. Long day, she repeats, because I could have sworn that you and Ina were commiserating about having gate guard duty last night. And as far as I'm aware, there were no major invasions today. So why are you attempting to pickle yourself, Sasuke? Sasuke gives her a moody look and steals the glass as the bartender attempts to pass it to her. He downs it in one go, then orders, just bring the bottle, and waves the man away. It's a stall, though, and from the way Sakura is watching him, she knows it. He's never been good with words. Painfully awful is closer to the truth, really. So he doesn't try to sugarcoat anything as he rubs his hands over his face and asks, Have you ever heard of Uzushio Gakure? Yes, Sakura answers promptly, which is to be expected, likely. Sasuke considers himself fairly book smart, but he's never been as voracious a learner as Sakura, who likes knowing things just for the sheer joy of knowing them. A former shinobi village in Whirlpool Country, traditionally allies with Kanaha, which was destroyed by Kiri during the Third Shinobi War. Kanaha flak jackets all bear Uzushio's spiral mark as a sign of the long-standing friendship between the villages. Rebuilt now, Sasuke tells her, mouth tightening as he remembers the pair at the gates. Two of their emissaries arrived today, and one of them said that their kage is in Uzumaki. 
Sakura gets it in the space of a heartbeat, and as the bartender sets their sake down, she snags it, pops the cork, and takes a long swallow directly from the bottle. The implications are clear enough, really. They've been looking for any sign of Naruto for years. Sakura as well in the beginning, though she's mostly given up hope now. And in seven years, they've never found so much as a hint, not a word with any sort of dependability behind it. Family is family, and if the reason they haven't found anything is the same as the reason no one has heard of Uzushio's reconstruction, seals and barriers, and a good spymaster, Jiraiya had said, then maybe, maybe, maybe there's finally a chance.